Amen. Well, please turn to Jude. We're, we're going to finish our five-part series in Jude. Jude 22 and 23. Let's read it. <clears throat> Be merciful to those who doubt. Save others by snatching them from the fire. To others show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. The NASV says, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Well, this morning I'm going to try not to get too excited, but I believe I'm going to get excited preaching this message because it's about saving souls. It's about the lost. You know, in contending for the faith, Judah said we must build ourselves up on the faith we've seen. We must pray in the Holy Spirit, keep ourselves in the love of God while waiting eagerly for the mercy of eternal life to come. But Jude doesn't stop there. Verse 22 begins with a little word, and. If you have the NIV version, it's not in and. There's not an and there. But there should be. And, a word the NIV leaves out, but it should be in the NASV. This word and means that, the, that uh, something is demanded to follow. Namely, the salvation of souls is a parallel duty in contending for the faith. Do you believe that? Contending for the faith is, just, is not just to be a fortress-type mentality. We don't just lock ourselves up in the fort and let the battle come to us and remain secluded there, allowing the Lord to fight our battles while we stay hidden. That's not the, that's not the case. It's not true. The faith, which defines the gospel, is not a take-it-or-leave-it thing. We are not only to defend it when it becomes when it comes under attack, but what are we to do? We're to proclaim it. We're to proclaim it to the world. So while we are waiting for our eternal life to come, we are to be reaching out to those who are still lost and do not have eternal life. That's the goal. Is that the goal? You recall Paul's words in Acts 20, 29. You can go over there. He said, even from your own number, men will rise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. In order to draw away disciples to false teaching. 2 Peter 2.2 2 says, many will follow them. They will bring the way of truth into dispute. 2 Peter 2.2. 2. The point, what have, we, what have we been talking about in Jude? The false Teachers are claiming souls. This really is a battle for the souls of men, and the stakes are extremely high. How high do you think the stakes are? Heaven or hell? That's really what the stakes are all about. And that's souls. In this section before us this morning, we're going to see three groups of people. And remember, Jude constantly uses these uh, three points all throughout his letter. We're going to see these three groups of people that Jude says we must reach with the gospel. But we're also going to see that Jude's advice on how to reach and treat each group will say a lot about our own walk with the Lord. So let's pray. Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, I thank you that we here know you as our Savior. And if somebody here doesn't, Lord, I ask that you'll open up their uh, heart to hear and to see the truth. Lord, let us be a church that not only loves you, but outwardly loves you by obeying you. Let us have a heart for people, a heart for souls. Let us continue to love one another as we come here and that we honor you and glorify you in our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So let's look at this first group, those who are doubting. To the doubter, Jude says to what? Show mercy. Do you see that? Show mercy. This word doubt doesn't mean they are inclined to not believe. Rather, they are not sure what to believe. The Greek word means to be divided against oneself, to be a person of two minds, to be undecided. Webster says, to waver in opinion. We have all met people like this to one degree or another, from issues on sports, religion, and politics. We just went through this. Remember they said, who's going to decide the national election? The undecideds, right? We have all been, though, truthfully, undecided on something in our life, on one issue or another. We may not have a 
full understanding of something, and you become one of the undecideds. Usually, though, it's because if we are undecided about something, it's because we're uneducated about something. Who here is educated on everything? I need to talk to you if you are. What happens when we're not educated on something, on a topic? We do the next best thing, don't we? Well, I feel like it means this. Or, well, I think, hmm, I think, or we just trust in what somebody else who seems like an expert says on the matter without investigating it for ourselves. And that's what happens. So we have to ask ourselves, who are these doubters and what are they doubting? Let's look at the context. False teachers with persuasive speech. They've invaded the church. They're seeking to gather a following, and they're causing divisions in verse 19. These false teachers were raising questions and putting a new spin on what had been taught by the apostles. The faith once for all delivered that we saw in verse 3. So 2 Peter 3.16 says they distort or they twist the scriptures as well as they add the scriptures, their new insight, and they bring on new little thoughts and new revelation they have received in their dreams. You see that in verse 8 of Jude. Some in the church were now, they were thrown into doubt. Have you ever known somebody in their faith that doubts or has doubt about God's word? The confused may be saying here, well, These teachers seem to be making some good points. I hear that today from people. I had not looked at those scripture verses that way before. What they are saying sounds plausible, and they're even sincere. And hey, look at how many people are following them. That's got to be some credibility right there. So you see these type of people, they're plagued. They're now plagued with questions, weighing the claims of both sides. They find themselves of two minds on the issue, and they doubt. Oh, truly, how does Satan love to make us doubt, right? Has that happened to you in your life? Remember his very first words in the garden were to create doubt as to what God's word really said. He said, did God really say, remember? Did God really mean that? You don't really believe that, right? Do you? So remember now that while Jude, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he has exposed false teachers as what? They're ungodly. They were devoid of the Spirit. They don't appear that way on the surface to many people. They have winsome ways about themselves. They use flattering speech, and they're generally well-liked. But their deceptions are not very obvious. They're very subtle. Remember, we talked about this. And truth here was at stake. And these doubters were hanging in the balance. So what does Jude say? What does Jude say to do with these who are undecided, who are confused as to what to believe? He says, knock them out. He says, be merciful. Have mercy. Show some compassion for them. That's it. Really? I can do that. Just pity them. That's not hard. Just feel sorry for them. I can do that. That doesn't seem too hard. I can obey that command. I can have mercy on them. It would seem Judas telling us how to feel and not what to do. Unless you understand the word. This word mercy translated always means to feel pity and compassion for the plight of another that acts to meet the need. That's the part. It acts to meet the need. We see this in God. And God in his compassion and mercy upon us in our plight, he acted to save us, right? Titus 3, 5. He saved us. Why? Not because of righteous things he had done, but because of his mercy he saved us, right? What is the action we are to take out of mercy? What, what What type of action then should we do? Hasn't Jude already told us? We should contend for the faith. It's that simple. Contend for the faith once for all delivered. Remember, it's your most holy faith. We do it patiently with grace and with compassion. While they are doubting, we graciously, kindly present the truth. 
Help them see the light from the Word of God. Persuade them, convince them to be of one mind. We should try to win them to the truth. With these undecided people, there's a spiritual tug of war going on. Just picture it in your head, and, and you're struggling, and there's a real battle going on here. We should fight for their souls. Pull, pull, pull with all your might. Is that how you look at them? Are you pulling with all your might for their souls? People that you know who are doubters. Jews said, be merciful instead of just reason with them. Because why would he say be merciful rather than just reason with them? He wants us to have the right heart attitude. With real mercy, you have to have a sense of care for someone. We can reason with anybody. We can debate with anybody and not give a, give a care about what we're saying or that person. Sometimes there can be such zeal for the truth and orthodox doctrine that anyone who dares to raise a question or express a doubt or uncertainty, they can be dismissed as a what? As a heretic. You're just done. You're out. You don't believe the way we do. Jude doesn't say to just write them off. He doesn't say get disgusted with them. He doesn't say get defensive or exasperated because they don't get it or because they don't understand it as clearly as we might understand it. We need to drop any spirit, any spirit of arrogance in our walk and remember God's mercy and his patience that he had with us, right? We must be told this because it runs against our human instincts. Blast them, ignore them, fight them, write them off. We get this feeling that makes us want to go to battle. That's not, that's not the feeling we should have, no. We should show compassion. How can we do that? Invite them over. As Eldon would say, go get a bagel with them. Right, Eldon? Get off in a corner in a heartfelt love of compassion. Seek to persuade them. Seek to win them. Address their doubts biblically in love. If they eventually reject the truth and follow false teachers, they're going to demonstrate in time that they never really knew the Lord in the first place. But that is yet undecided while it is still, while they are still here. So we should be doing something. Try to win them in the Spirit's power, right? By the way, I would hope that anybody here at uh, Eagle Creek would see this is a safe place. We're family here. This is a safe place for you where any question about our faith can be asked. I promise we'll have an answer. But it's okay. It's a place of safety without ridicule. You know, uh, Gabe and Kayla up at Purdue, um, they've been contending for the faith. They've been actually experiencing quite a bit of persecution. And, and they're in this one Bible study, and it comes from a church that is... Um, probably a little bit off base, right? And so I found out that she um, had a friend who's leading a Bible study in this church, and they went to it, and contending for the faith ensued. So I'm going to read this letter. It's a, it's a little long, but I'll, I'll read it quickly. I said to myself, this is how we do it in love. I said, dear, mm, a lot of things have been on my heart these past couple of weeks since we talked at the coffee shop. I thought I made my intentions very clear about only sharing with you my concerns because I love you. It has broken my heart how you have responded to our conversation. I have noticed that you've been avoiding me, and you haven't really said a word to me since we talked. If you think I am wrong, please at least defend your views and share them with me. Ignoring my concerns simply reveals a heart unwilling to listen to the Bible where it may contradict your views. As a sister in Christ, it is my utmost responsibility to address these areas I see in other believers that may need some pruning. I said, hmm. I hope you would do the same for me, should you see any error in me, as we are sisters. This is how Jesus prunes. He uses believers to enact confrontation, correction, conviction, repentance, and transformation in our lives. I was expecting you to be more receptive to what I was saying because you're one of my closest friends, and I love you. And I would never do anything to hurt you or our friendship. 
I was hoping you would see the scripture I was showing you and realize the biblical truth of what I was saying. Unfortunately, this was not the case. You may think that the way you conduct Bible study is simply an approach. But this approach that you are using attempts to speak love, but it is an approach that may accidentally be leading non-believers to their doom, thinking they are saved. I especially wanted to bring this to your attention because I don't think that you are aware of it. Jesus was probably the most confrontational man to ever walk the planet because he continuously went to sinners, spent time with them, and dearly loved them to the point that he would share the very offensive truth with them. He didn't stop at saying, I love you. That's where your approach stops. Jesus went further. Every single time he was speaking with somebody in sin, he confronted them and led them towards repentance and lifestyle transformation. Unfortunately, I have noticed that your approach is so concerned with people not getting their feelings hurt, it is losing sight of repentance. By being non-confrontational and allowing feelings to govern a group of discussions, biblically unsound doctrine is permeating into your Bible studies. As a result of unbiblical ideas and surface-level understanding, people begin to think that Jesus can fit into their sinful lives instead of realizing that they need to completely turn their sinful lives and allow Jesus to fit into their lives and sanctify them, cleansing them of their dirtiness. Clearly not one man is without sin. This implies that believers are sinful and are not required to be perfect. However, believers do not want to sin. When they do, they're grieved by it. They desperately want to be holy like God is because they have the Holy Spirit residing within them. They want to obey God because they love Him. If somebody is claiming to be a Christian but is enthralled with sin, like the group that you have, and no, no one's holding them accountable, and gleefully, with no remorse, goes out to party every night, participates in sexual immorality, continually having sex outside of marriage, is drinking and partying, and worships Mary and denies Jesus, or anything that is that type of lifestyle, is really a denial of Christ. A person like this absolutely 100% needs to be confronted and led towards repentance, but that's not happening there. We all fall into sin, but people of genuine faith will turn from those sins and allow the Spirit to wash their dirty feet daily. They most definitely do not throw their sin in God's face laughing. That is what it means to take up your cross and follow Jesus, repent and realign your life with Jesus every day because we are bound to fall into sin as imperfect humans. When we do fall, though, we get back up by the Holy Spirit's power. Because, I love this line of answer, she made it up herself, she said she did. We do not savor the flavor of sin. We spit it out. We do not savor the flavor. Why is it that many people in, in your Bible study and church claim Jesus, yet they live in a lifestyle sin? Most likely these people may not know Christ. Doesn't this break your heart? It breaks mine. Many of the people you're leading and study who claim Jesus outwardly show proof they do not know him. And this might be because of the approach you're using to share Jesus with them. I know you don't mean to. The true message of the gospel that God has zero tolerance for sin, so he sent his only son to pay our penalty and cover our sins with his perfection. There is no room for continuously selfful, willful lifestyle. It's not enough to just believe in God. We must repent. The approach you are using is fostering this behavior. Why would you ever want to allow people to think they're saved but know that their lifestyle doesn't match and not tell them? The group of people you're leading definitely feels your love, but they only hear that. They hear, come follow Jesus, but it's okay. You can keep sinning. We love you. Jesus says, go and sin no more because I love you. You're leaving out the most crucial part of repentance. You say that your focus is love. I want to challenge you, and I want you to please think about it because I love you. And ask the question, what is love? Is it emotionally driven? Is it accepting everyone? Is it always agreeing? If you answered yes to those questions, your view of love is not truly the most biblical view of love. Herein lies our problem. Love can absolutely be your focus because it was Jesus' focus. If you are showing biblical love, biblical love is not driven by what makes you or somebody else happy and it does not cater to others' feelings. The love of Jesus is offensive because it calls for change. God's love is definitely intolerant and does not accept everyone and, uh, in their sins without repentance. He only accepts those who repent of their sins and follow him. In the same way, biblical love is not about agreeing with other people. Real love is about showing them the way to Christ that brings forth change. The Bible calls us to contend and defend the word against false teachers. False teachers are by definition wrong, and in your church they're teaching you wrong. I want to reemphasize that I, I believe and know you are saved. You are a cherished out of our Father, and he is proud of you and your heart for him and for others. Concern only arises with biblical discrepancies in the way you approach reaching the lost. I just wanted to talk to you about this.
I just want you to be aware that the method you use may accidentally be leading some people away from Jesus because it's not the true gospel. We must repent, change from our sin, and follow Jesus alone, not just swim in his love. Do we agree with that? I said, hey, you knocked that out. You kicked that, you kicked that right out of the park. That's amazing. I mean, that was, <laughs> I said, how did it go? Well, they met again, and things are working. And she's seen it and actually went to another pastor. And this friend is hopefully turning towards the truth. Isn't that amazing? That's contending for the faith. They were doubting. They were, mis- they, they were uh, uh, confused. And she took it upon herself. So, hey, she's not going to be probably too pleased I use it, but I did. So we see those who are doubting. In group two, those who must be snatched from the fire. To this group, Jude says, show boldness. When Jude says, save others or snatch others, he does not mean that the first group was not in need of saving. They were. They were just undecided, the first group, in need of mercy, with an urgent persuasion to the truth. But those in this second group, they're not doubters. They're not undecided. They're not of two minds. These people have made their minds up, okay? Jude's second group of fallen Christians... He, has gone further than doubt. They are actually playing with fire. They have begun to engage with the thinking and lifestyle of those who change the grace of God into a license for immorality, verse 4. And if people are convinced that some behavior traditionally uh, denoted immoral is actually acceptable for Christians, they will see no reason to avoid it once that starts happening. They are not asking honest questions to decide anymore. They have made their decision. They have brought into the doctrines, they have bought into the doctrines of false teachers. They have joined them in changing the, the grace of God into license. Verse 4. So dialogue, discussions, reason is getting you nowhere. If there are questions coming from this group, they are not honest questions seeking to learn, like the undecided first group. The problem with this group, especially, is not their head, it's their heart. Their conscience must be reached. The fear of God and the prospect of certain judgment must be preached to them. These are people on the wrong path. In love and compassion, they must be told the truth. This group is on the road to hell, everybody. Uh, We don't like saying it, but they are. They are playing with fire, and a bold, direct, frontal approach must be taken to warn and deliver them. The first words of Jude's injunction are, Save them! Snatch them from the fire! Amazingly, some take this to mean save them from the fires of their sinful passions. Mm -mm. Nah, that's not what he means. Look at the context. Hasn't Jude already told us what he means by the fire? Look at verse 7. These are the very real fires of hell that burn now and will one day be uh, dumped into the lake of uh, fire of burning sulfur that will continue to burn day and night forever and ever. That's scary, isn't it? Revelation 20, 10 and 15. And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophets had been thrown. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown, thrown into the lake of fire. This is the eternal fire of or the fiery hell that Jesus warned men to take every precaution. Jesus warned man to take every precaution not to go there, no matter how extreme, to avoid it. Matthew 18, 8 and 9, what Jesus said. He said, if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life, it is better for you to enter life maimed or crippled than to have two hands or two feet and be thrown into eternal fire. There's the word. And if your eye causes you to stumble, to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into the, here he changes it, fire of hell. We don't hear these words too often today, do we? Are we? Do we even think about this place? These are the words of Jesus Christ. That is what we are to save them from. When you go share the gospel with somebody or you contend for the faith or you have a heart for somebody, you're saving them from that fire of eternal hell. 
Jude says, snatch them from or out of the fire. That's a pretty strong word. There's nothing subtle about that word, is there? This word means to take by force or seize it and carry it off or claim it eagerly for oneself. Do you see the emphasis he's trying to put on people's souls, what we're to do? Take them by force. Seize and carry them off. Claim them eagerly for yourself. Snatch them from the fire. We get the English word harpoon. <laughs> harpoon them. Remember, what's on the other end of a harpoon? A rope. Harpoon them. To seize or grip. It is the word used of the rapture of the church in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. It's translated caught up. Did you know one day Christ is coming back to snatch you? He's coming back one day to grab you. He's coming back one day to catch you up. It's a forceful action. He's going to come take us by force. Amen? Jude says, act. You know that hell is a certain for them who do not believe. It's heaven is a certain for you who do believe. Save them. Snatch them out of the fire, he's saying. Man, Jude perhaps has in mind, since he has already mentioned Sodom and Gomorrah in verse 7, the action of the two angels. Do you remember the actions of the two angels in Genesis 19? When the two angels sent from heaven, that when they went to the city of Sodom and Gomorrah that was about to be destroyed by God with fire and brimstone, what did the angels do? They urged Lot and his family to get out. Get out now. Before they be swept away by the fiery judgment that was about to fall on the city. And what did Lot do? He hesitated. So what did the angels do? They snatched them. That's the same word. The angels grasped them and they seized them. And they took him by his hand and Lot's family and they led them to safety. Do you see the picture? For the Lord, here's the beautiful part. In Genesis 19.16. He was merciful to them. You get the theme? There was no time for dialogue. The fire of God's judgment was on its way. It was time to act with boldness. In Zechariah 3, 1 and 2, God spoke of Israel, represented by Joshua, delivered from Satan's judgment. What did he refer to them as? A burning stick snatched from the fire. Listen. There is no one hopelessly so lost in sin, even though it appears that the flames of God and the flames of judgment are licking up all around them, that it's too late for them to be talked to. People can be caught up in all forms of immorality. They can be caught up in various kinds of drugs and alcohol. They can be caught up in the love of this world. People can buy into the uh, twisting of scriptures that justifies their own immoral lifestyles that justifies the sin of abortion, that justifies the sin of homosexuality or adultery or divorce, and we can come up with every form of excuse, and it's happening within the church, and it may seem that it's impossible to reach them. It may seem that they're too far gone. But listen, here there is no one who is too far gone, yet no one is beyond God's power to deliver through believers who will warn them, who will pray for them, who will weep over them, but will also have the courage with boldness to go to them and snatch them out of the fire and be a tool of God to save them. You say, but I can't save anybody. I can't force anybody to be saved. I can't willfully persuade anybody. You're right. We know that. And we all know that it is God who saves, right? Who saves? It is God who opens up our hearts. It is the Holy Spirit who convicts men of their sin and judgment to come. It is the Spirit that works repentance. But none of that truth about God's sovereignty and man's salvation should cause us to evade our responsibility when it comes to saving souls. The Apostle Paul never worried about that. Compare these two statements by Paul. In 1 Corinthians 1.21 he says, For since in the wisdom of God the word through the world I'm going to start over. For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him, God was uh, pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. 
in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, to the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. You don't have to save them all. You just have to go and tell and let God do the saving. Hear me. We ought to pray and trust like everything depends on God because it does. And plea and persuade and seek to save men like everything depends on us. And somewhere in the middle, God will weave those two things together. Right? We love the story of SMA. Who's the SMA team? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the SMA team. And Daniel, who were saved by God from the fiery furnace, right? But how much more wonderful are the stories of people snatched from the fire, saved from fire's judgment? Do you want to be part of that? We should want to be part of that. So we see the first group are those who are doubting, and the second group are those who must be snatched from the fire, and the last group, those polluted by the flesh. Uh Uh-oh. Man, he just keeps getting worse. To this group, Jude says, show caution. Show caution. To others, show mercy mixed with fear, hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh. If Jude Jude is moving progressively, then this group that they were to approach with fear and caution would be in some way worse than the first two groups. Who would they be in the context of Jude? This third group would be the false teachers themselves, the heretics, and those who are wholeheartedly leading people astray and who wholeheartedly bought into the lies and false doctrines and are actively, actively promoting them. Do you guys know people like that? Jesus says that they that we are to show mercy to them still. Notice all three groups we still show mercy. We still love them. Showing mercy and seeking to save them also, just as the previous groups. No one is just to be written off in disgust, no matter how polluted their lifestyle. But Jude says approach them with caution, with a mercy mixed with fear. Hating even the clothing stained by corrupted flesh or polluted. Obviously, sins of the flesh do not literally stain the clothing. I'm telling you, if sin stained my actual clothing, I would look really bad right now. How about you? (laughs) Jude is using a biblical metaphor here where the clothing represents life. The life. The idea being that the inner, inward corruption of this group is clearly seen in the stained and polluted clothing of their lifestyle. That once clothing presents the life, we see that in Revelation 19, 8, where the church is clothed in fine linen and bright and clean. Revelation 7, 13, and 14 speaks of martyred saints during the coming tribulation who are clothed in white robes having washed their robes white in the blood of the Lamb. In Revelation 3, 4, where there were a few uh, in Sardis who did not, what did they not do? They did not soil their clothes in the sin that was going on around them. If you, if you go back to Zechariah 3, 3 through 4, where we previously saw Joshua referred to as a burning stick snatched from the fire, the next verse, it pictures his life as filthy garments which the Lord took off of him and replaced with clothing described as rich and clean. If you know Christ as your Savior, he did that for you. Amen? Joshua's filthy garments represented his life of sin that God removed from him. That's exactly what happened to anyone who happens to anyone when they come to know Christ. When you go out and you share the gospel with somebody and you, through the Holy Spirit, Bring them to Christ. You're changing their clothing right there. God's changing their clothing right in front of your eyes. We are clothed with Christ, Galatians 3.27. And we're clothed with his robe of righteousness, 2 Corinthians 3.21. Are you happy about that? Has that changed your life? Jude says we are to approach these ringleaders with mercy mixed with fear. Why? Why? Once we have seen the reality of the fire, we shall be more clearly aware of the risk that these people are running. This is the fear and the reverential awe of God that enables us to truly hate 
sin. And the sins of the flesh that so pollute and defile our lives. Sins that so ruin and destroy the lives of people. Sin that defies God and costs Jesus Christ his very life. It costs God his son and Christ his life. Psalm 97.10 said, Let those who love the Lord hate evil. Do you hate evil? Do you hate sin? We teach our kids from young age, don't use the word hate. You can't hate. Well, we should hate sin. For he guards the lives of his faithful ones, though, and he delivers them from the hands of the wicked. Proverbs 8.13, to fear the Lord is to hate evil. When Jude says hate, he does not mean a malicious attitude, but a proper sense of aversion and loathing of the sin, not the hate of the person, right? Jude doesn't say hate them, but their political clothing, which we have seen as their sin. It's their corrupt lifestyle. Yet we have the wonderful offer of a change of clothing for their stained, polluted clothing. Isn't that amazing? We are to offer it in love, and we're to offer it in mercy, but at the same time never toying with tolerating the sin. Once once sin in your life is treated as normal, once you start treating sin as acceptable or commonplace, or we, we ourselves begin to compromise, and we start compromising with it instead of hating it, and then you're way on your way to betraying the gospel, and you're way on your way of trampling grace. I've been there. I know some of you may probably have been there too. I know we've all trampled on grace at one time or other. We are to show mercy towards the sinner, the polluted one, while at the same time hating the polluted sin. Far too often, we as believers, we don't get that right. We feel disgust for the person instead of the pollution. Disdain instead of mercy and pity for the sinner. We forget the mercy God has shown us far too often, and we forget that Jesus died on Calvary for their sins as well as he did for ours. And we're coming back in uh, next week to look at the manger and look what Jesus said, what Jesus has done for us, what God has done for us. We're getting ready to celebrate. That's hating the sin and hating the sinner. We're not to hate the sin and hate the sinner, are we? We forget that God so loved the world, that is the world of sinners of which they are part of, that he sent his son to die for them as well as he died for us, that they also might not perish like we aren't going to perish. And we should have the heart to go out and give them the same and share with them the same. Yet there's an opposite problem going on of that, of this. And that is the idea I hear over and over again, especially from the millennial generation and especially in the youth today, the youth generation. You'll hear them say it. The live and let live idea. Do what you want as long as you don't affect me. Who are you to judge their lifestyle? Who are you to talk about what they do? Don't judge them, and they have got it all wrong. That's not hating the sin. And it's also not loving the person. So we need to get it right. We need to hate the sin, and we need to be fearful of it so that we don't allow that to permeate in our life while we rest in God's strength, but love the sinner. Until we start loving the lost, We're not going to have a heart to share. So what is our takeaway from what Judas said? Those who are doubting, those who must be snatched from the fire, those polluted by the flesh. It's a call for mercy. Because we have received the same mercy, how then can we cop a holier-than-thou attitude? That's not what's required. Jude's letter is filled with scathing condemnation of God's certain judgment upon the ungodly. But we also read in Jude's letter of God's love, a love that in mercy saved us, right? Without that mercy, where would we be? And God loves lost sinners, even the mockers, and he loves the arrogant, he loves the worldly, he loves the false teachers, the agnostics, the atheists, the morally corrupt, the murderer, the child molesters, homosexuals, the prostitute, the pornographer, and on it goes. He loves them. Their judgment is looming, though, and their peril is great. Even now in their unrepentant state, the fires of hell are awaiting them. But they're not there yet, right? Their fate is not yet finalized. There is still hope in this life for them. 
And there's a call for us to do something about it. Paul tells us to remember in Ephesians 2.11 that in our former days before we were saved, we were children of wrath. One day before we were saved, we were going to experience the wrath of God ourselves, heading for hell before God in his rich mercy saved us, Ephesians 2.4. Amen? We then are to show them the same mercy that God has shown us and share with them the same gospel that was one day shared with us so that they also may be saved. Tell them about Jesus. Tell them about the Jesus who died for you, who also died for them. Tell them how Jesus is love and how he forgave you and how he can do that for them. Jesus concluded this, his instructions on how to treat sinners in the world. Those who hate, persecute, and rob with these words, he said, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Luke 6, 36. He goes in 35, but love your enemies. Do good to them. Then your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your father is merciful. We receive the kindness of God. Wow. Then there's the enclosing urgency. Save them, snatch them, souls are perishing. What will we do? What should we do? If flames are engulfing your house and there's people sleeping in the bed, what are you supposed to do? You get in there and you snatch them out of there. Or you call 911, you're getting something moving. If someone is drowning, when and how do you act? Splash a little harder. <laughs> no, you're going to dive in. Obviously, they have a problem. They can't swim to the shore on their own. Why can't we, why can we see these things so clearly in the physical realm, but we have so much trouble seeing it that way spiritually? We have to ask ourselves, where are our hearts? We need to be like the two angels in Genesis and showing the mercy of the Lord. We need to take them by the hand and lead them out, knowing that God's judgment's about to fall. Listen, I experienced it again this week. You think life is going along fine, <laughs> and something changes. We're finite. Only holiness can produce a hatred of sin, finally. True holiness, separation from sin. If we are truthful, there are many sins we do not hate. Some we only dislike and some we tolerate. Some we're numb to and some we like and some we love. Hey, you know your own heart. If somebody told me that they hated peas, I'd be surprised to see them eating peas. It's still my one act of rebellion against my mom. I hate peas and I don't eat them. You're never going to see me eating peas. If you hate something, don't do it. Also, it's easy to hate sin we see in others. But do we tolerate degrees of it in our own lives? Remember this keeping ourselves in God, God's love, part of this, and abiding with Christ? Part of having that great, deep abiding is obedience. The key to real victory is not just trying to eliminate sin, but the key to real victory is drawing closer to God. There in His holy light, that's where you'll see clearly. There in his presence, we will see the terrible pollution of sin in the light of his mercy and in the light of his love and his grace. Thank God for that. Hate evil, you who love the Lord. Psalm 97.10 Our hatred of sin is a measure of our love for the Lord. And it's a revealer of the state of our relationship with him. It's a litmus test. So, building, we saw in this five-part series. Building, praying, keeping, waiting, and saving. Are we doing it? What a challenge. The next two weeks, we're going to depart from Jude, and we're going to go to the birth of our Savior. We're going to finish Jude on uh, January 1st with a New Year's message. But I know if we are a building your faith church, we will have the knowledge of the Word. And we will be good stewards of the faith that's entrusted to us.
I know if we are praying in the Holy Spirit, church, we will be a church who loves prayer and works through the Spirit's power. And I know if we are a church who keeps themselves in God's love, we will be a deeply abiding in Christ's church because we obey him out of love for him. And I know if we are waiting for the mercy of Christ's church, we will be anxiously looking for Christ, and we will live with urgency in our lives for his will with eternal-minded thinking. We will live in light of eternity. And I know if we are a saving souls church, we will be pleasing to the Lord and fulfilling his ultimate purpose. Because who are we? We are his ambassadors, are we not? Building, praying, keeping, waiting, and saving. So this this, uh, next two weeks, we're going to touch more on this on New Year's Day. Until then, I ask you to please do these things. Be in the Word daily. Continue to be in the Word. Continue to be in the Gospels, growing close to Christ. Pray daily for this church. Pray daily for each other. Continue to love one another and build each other up. Ask the Lord to reveal doors of opportunity for you in your life. Look at yourself and see if there is any disobedient way in you and ask the Lord for strength to change it and have an I will moment in your life. And then begin each day with the end in mind. Remember last week, that meeting with Jesus, begin that day that ultimate meeting with Jesus. Allow that thought and reflection to transform your perspective by turning into an eternal-minded thinker. And finally, be intentful in looking for somebody to share the gospel with. And share it. Ask the Lord to give you the open door. I ask you to please accept this challenge. You won't regret it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit will be pleased with us. It will change our church It will change your personal life, and it will change the lives of others. Amen? Dear Lord, I thank you for this day. Lord, what what an amazing challenge, but one that we can do clearly through your strength. Lord, let us be people who love your word. Let us draw closer to you in it every day. Let us build ourselves up. Let us know the original so we can always see the counterfeit. Help us to love others enough to share with those who are doubting. Help us to recognize others that we need to snatch from the fire. Lord, give us a heart, your heart. Give us your eyes. Lord, let us be looking for your return at any time, or Lord, at any time you may take us home. We may not have another day to live. Lord, let us be intentful in our eternal mindedness. Lord, I ask that this church here be lifted up and that you'll continue to bless as we move forward uh, into our week. Lord, we thank you as we're coming up on the season that you loved us out of your kindness. You were merciful to us and that you sent us your son and paved the way. We thank you for this, Lord. In your precious and holy name, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen.